Hello, good morning, good afternoon, oh. good evening, everybody. I'm very happy that you are joining us today to celebrate World Soil Day in 2022. And the topic of this year is Soils Where Food Begins. I will quickly go through the agenda of the session of today. And just for the people who joined later, we have um, interpretation available in English and Spanish. Para las personas que um, están entrando ahorita. For those who are now joining the workshop, we have interpretation available in English and Spanish. And there is a world icon in the bottom part of your screen. And you can choose the language of your preference can choose the lang language you want to listen to. So today's session, we will I will have a quick introduction about Naturland Association in relation to soil. Then I will hand over to Hiku Kim. He is from the Food and Agriculture Organization and he will talk about soil fertility and plant nutrition where food security begins. Um, we will have a Q&A session and also some polls. And then we will hand over to Kamel Abu Farah from Kana and Fairtrade, who, will, who is a member of Naturland. And he will talk about biodiversity and soil. Then uh, after that, we have another Q&A session and I will close the uh, meeting. Please also feel free to post your questions anytime in the chat and we try to pick them up during the session. So Naturland Association is an organic farmers association. It operates international. We have around 140,000 farmers, beekeepers and fish farmers who produces and uh, according to the Naturland producer standards in around 60 countries. And the Naturland standard has a strong focus on soil management. And I just go a little bit back in history because Naturland is celebrating 40 years anniversary this year. It was founded in 1982. And also the producer standard of Naturland was developed and the processing standard by that time. Then over the time, other standards came along. It's a social responsibility is also now included. And we have also the fair trade standard or standard on aquatic. But uh, what I really want to point out that we have a strong focus on soil management to cover different topics regarding prevention and mitigation of land degradation to control soil erosion to manage soil organic matter for enhancement of soil fertility and carbon sequestration, and especially um, improve the water use and management in agriculture. We also have a water man management plan for region where scarcity of water. And this all you can find here in the Naturland producer standard. I also have the slide in Spanish. Also, Naturland Association does a lot of seminars um, online and in person and also hybrid in relation to soil. So I had some examples here, what we did this year in 2022. We had an um, online seminar on green, green manure management in three languages. It, languages. it was in Italian, Spanish, and English. We also had a seminar with the sugarcane producers from Latin and Middle America to talk about sugarcane production also in relation to soil management. We had a in-person, but it was a, like a hybrid workshop on organic tea production in North India. And also two weeks ago, we had a um, a workshop in Spain, an in-person workshop on water management with also strong focus on soil management. You can also find a lot of information on our webpage. It, it's also in different languages available. 
regarding soil and fertilization. Also here on the document parts, you find different documents which have been developed over time also for compost or for manure management um, in relation to soil. There are also projects ongoing. Naturaland has one project in Serbia and Slovenia um, focusing on improving carbon balances um, in these two countries. There's also the Georgian organic farming for the future project. We had um, online trainings and in-person trainings on soil management. And here you can see where we had the tea farmers gathered together and there's a mobile lab and Ilya, who is uh, managing this mobile lab, is explaining what you can do like with um, soil analysis um, on, on farm. Now we come to, our, to what we want to do today to celebrate the World Soil Day. So in December 2013, the United Nations General Assembly designed the first World Soil Day on the 5th of December in 2014. And since then, it's held annually on the 5th of December. But I mean, it's like, it's a celebration. So we have, we have chosen the 6th of December, like the whole week is kind of celebrating the, the soil. And it's, it's on to advocate for healthy soils and sustainable soil resources. resources. And the theme of this year, what I already mentioned, is soil where food begins. And that's why I show you this slide, because soil has many functions, as you can see here. But of course, one of the main, let's say, ecosystem services is the provision of food, fiber, and fuel. And for this, I had prepared two quiz questions. And the first one is, how much of our food is directly or indirectly produced on soil? And how much of global biodiversity is sustained by soil? So we have prepared a poll so you can vote for it. Por el momento han votado 57 personas. Quizás podemos esperar unos segundos más. Mm -hmm. 57 people have voted so far. Many, maybe we can wait for a couple more minutes. Okay, so we can see there are still people voting. We see that uh, for the first question, how much of our food is directly or indirectly produced on soil? The majority voted for 95%, which is the correct. Sorry, still people voting. <laughs> but um, okay, so we have. Um, this 95% of the majority of the people voted. It, this is actually the correct answer. And for the second questions, how much of global biodiversity is sustained by soil? The majority said 50, that would be even better, I think, but in uh, the correct answer would be 25. So I also have, have summed it up. So actually 95% of our food is really directly or indirectly produced on soil and 25% of global biodiversity is sustained by soil. And 
I thank you for your attention. And I also would like to thank my colleagues who are supporting the, the whole event today. And now I will hand over to Hiku Kim, who is a technical advisor at the Plant Protection and uh, Production Division at the Food and Agriculture Organization in Italy, Rome. And he will give a speech on soil fertility and plant nutrition, where food security begins. So, so Hiko, the floor is yours. Thank you, Eva, for the introduction. Uh, my name is Hiko Kim, uh, and I will try to uh, go with you on this, uh, I would say, journey to discover a bit more about what the highlight of this year is, but also to connect with the plants, the crops that we grow in the soil. Uh, as you, you have uh, uh, heard, this year, theme of the World Soil Day is about soils where food begins. I put as a subtitle of uh, this presentation a bit more uh, linked to my uh, area. Uh, I'm a crop physiologist, plant physiologist by background. So I will talk about the connection, the relationship between soil fertility and soil nutrition. And question ourselves, uh, actually, uh, I will ask you also a lot of question on uh, where the food security issue is uh, important, especially for the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization. Uh, so uh, quickly, the outline of my presentation will follow this. And as reminded by Eva, I will not go too much into detail of uh, the meaning, the reason why we celebrate the World Soil Day, but go into the detail of the relation between soil and plant nutrition, as well as the nexus between soil, plant, and food security. With some examples from the various fields that I worked, uh, various places that I worked, with uh, highlights of some results. And Finally, I would like to reflect with you some question uh, and possible advice from your side, actually. So, uh, well, I'm Korean uh, by uh, birth, but uh, I quite traveled a bit uh, around the world. And I grew up in Africa, actually in Gabon, in the equatorial African forest, where like the country is 99% uh, rainforest. Uh, so, but I was nearby the seaside. So though very humid and not very friendly environment, the forest, uh, the plants are where uh, the, the place where they enjoy most probably. Uh, then I did uh, also travel quite uh, in different countries, especially in France, uh, where I did uh, my higher degrees, but also in Australia. And then I later on also worked uh, in Ethiopia and in Korea. So I will reflect those experience uh, in my presentation and some of the example that I will give. So uh, as a plant science researcher, more specifically as a crop physiologist, I worked on different crops from very, uh, as you know, uh, basic science uh, crop, Arabidopsis salania, to various cereals, uh, sorghum, uh, wheat, uh, maize, rice, uh, the staple crop, but also sesame, uh, for example. So uh, those are the crops that I would also take example from. So. Going into the reason that we are here together to celebrate uh, this World Food, uh, World Soil Day. Uh, as Eva mentioned, it was since 2013 where uh, FAO conference uh, this endorsed this, and then 
we are in the ninth year of the celebration in terms of the World uh, Soil Day. Uh, this year, uh, just a snapshot of a couple of examples of uh, places that were celebrated. So in the FAO website, you can trace and track all the places. Apparently this year, there is more than 1,500 uh, events across the world. Uh, here I put an example of uh, our own event uh, that is also mentioned, but also yesterday in Italy, where I am in Rome, uh, an event uh, by the Italian research organization and local uh, institute. Like uh, another example on top, uh, the World uh, Food Day celebrated, uh, so they celebrated in Korea. Uh, this year, one of the highlights of the World So Day was the release of uh, some of the uh, key publication, including Asia, an Asian soul map. So that was also something the Korean uh, research organization contributed to. So that was one of the highlights. Black soil publication and related data was also published uh, officially yesterday. So you can go to the FAO website on the World Soil Day and find the relevant information, uh, a picture of the hybrid event that was uh, organized yesterday. So. When we talk about soil, of course, it's uh, the focus of our attention, but uh, for the side, the food uh, component, need to have plants in between so that what soil offers, all the resource that soil provides is used by plants, and then we consume the plants in terms of sustainable development goals, there are multiple kind of uh, aspects from direct impact on carbon sequestration, nutrient recycling, but also many other functionalities. I will not go into the detail, but regulating flood and climate in the one hand, while in the other hand, you can have also impact uh, because it's uh, used for many other purpose uh, and there is a cultural side, a cultural heritage side that cannot be also neglected. So what's the nexus between soil fertility, plant nutrition, and ultimately the impact on food security? As you know, we have uh, a big challenge right now in the world uh, leading to what's estimated in 2050 up to 10 billion, close to 10 billion people, among which like two thirds would be living in urban areas, while most of the food is produced still in rural areas. So in face of this challenge, the sustainable production of the agricultural uh, productivity is a challenge while we have to maintain, ensure sustainable natural resource, especially the soil where we produce uh, the food, uh, where the plants grow. And in that context, uh, it is estimated there is uh, uh, almost already 800 million people in the context of COVID, uh, it increased a bit, uh, that are facing chronic hunger, while over 2 billion, I will go come back into the detail, uh, suffer micronutrient deficiency. However, uh, there are like proposed solutions and ways to uh, solve this, to, to match the challenges, to make a agri food system to be more efficient, inclusive, and resilient. That's the new proposed narrative of, also of the FAO uh, strategic from, framework for the next decade. And I will now go into the detail of the context uh, where I will, of course, as mentioned, in terms of number, that's quite staggering, like over 400 million in Asia, other, over 280 million in Africa. But in terms of proportion, of course, it's much more important in the Sub-Saharan Africa, the hunger, 60 million in Latin America and Caribbean. And this has been exacerbated during the COVID pandemic. As I mentioned, 
not only the ones who are suffering from hunger, you can also suffer from hidden hunger, what uh, we call the micronutrient deficiency. Lack of micronutrients in the soil is ultimately impacting uh, the health of people, especially that's related to nutrient-poor diet, like a uh, single uh, staple crop-based uh, uh, diet in many places, like rice in uh, Southern Asia, or maize in sub-Saharan Africa are also one of the contributing factors to this hidden hunger. And for that, we need to take into account of the soil health and the ultimate relation, the way plants then are able or not to grow in a healthy way in a, and then transmit the necessary nutrient to, to, to plants. So, this way here simply explained on the nexus between the soil, plant biomass, uh, and then what's converted into edible part of the plants and ultimately consumed by uh, people, by uh, humans. So it relates to the bioavailability that is uh, uh, inherent from where the food actually starts in the soil. So those available micronutrients from the macronutrient, you know, but the uh, major micronutrients such as iron, uh, zinc, uh, which impacts uh, also stunting uh, when it's deficient in uh, many countries uh, uh, and uh, other related uh, impact on human health. And this has a, a cost, a major cost for many uh, low and middle income countries in developing developing uh, global south. Of course, for that, uh, this year also, as uh, the highlights was on uh, the soil where food begins, the challenge of nutrient balance was uh, also something that was highlighted on how we can continue to grow uh, health, I mean, uh, plants in the soil, uh, how to overcome the nutrient depletion in uh, the soil that are uh, becoming uh, less and less productive. Uh, while on the other hand, there is also issue of pollution and environmental uh, related issue where uh, we use too much uh, external input to have then other problem uh, related to uh, greenhouse emission, uh, nitrogen, nitrous oxide emission, and others that contribute to uh, warming also. So some of the solutions recommended here are listed on uh, the need of soil mapping. If you highlighted this year in the context of fertilizer crisis also that uh, we need to have better ways to see the uh, need uh, the emphasis on crop diversification and use judicious use of fertilizer. The fertilizer for Coda is one of the products that they feel uh, promotes uh, the International Code of Conduct for sustainable use and fertilizer. So, and uh, the technical support needed, the need to adopt sustainable long term soil management practices. So, these are the theory how in practice do we then tackle this challenge? And here for some example, I would like to reflect uh, with you uh, how in your context or in the context I expose, uh, you can provide some solution. And I would like to learn also a bit more on how you tackle those challenges. So my example from are mostly from Sub-Saharan Africa where I worked while I was with CIMIT, the international, Mace and Wheat Research uh, uh, Institute uh, Research Center. So, uh, investigating the relation between soil and plant, you, we use different tools. Of course, uh, we can uh, dig into the soil and look at the different layers and see where are uh, the roots uh, going up to where. Uh, what depth, what extent, and that's quite uh, a deep. I, mean, uh, I don't know how many you also, if many of you are farmers, digging soil, it's not the most easy job, but uh, you, you learn more into, into that. But 
you can't do all the time. So climatic information, information like uh, using simple pH, uh, either pH meter or just uh, those uh, simple kids. Uh, knowing about the uh, relation between the solar radiation and the way plants grow here, uh, different tools, either solar uh, using the light intercept radiation, use efficiency are one of the important factor, but also doing soil analysis, as you know, to do you know, specific uh, at different depths with uh, here an uh, auger, you can go uh, to the topsoil, you can use the more deeper, different tool. And then uh, simple measurement like uh, the moisture of the topsoil is indicative on what's the best timing to get your plant or the variation throughout the season. So some of the tools are used in various way. Here, I will take you on a journey to go in different parts of Africa. Uh, here, it's mostly Ethiopia and uh, I saw some of you are from, uh, I saw one thing from uh, uh, Malawi. So I have a couple of uh, also pictures from Malawi here. You see from left uh, to right, like a black soil, very, as you know, very rich. I, as I mentioned, uh, there was a publication, a database also published on black soil. That's more the most productive uh, organ uh, organ, uh, carbon and uh, organic matter rich soil. There is also those red soil uh, that are like uh, those, uh, you, you know, very well, the type of soil, different way to work on the soil uh, before planting the, the crops. And then on the right side, the more sandy, sandy loam soil where uh, there is a like a fast uh, runoff or runoff of uh, whatever you put when uh, there is rain. And then on top, just a couple of uh, images on how plants can grow uh, various uh, ways. And I will dig into the more specific data that uh, that were collected in the different contexts. So from a very supposedly productive soil type to a more uh, sandy soil, but uh, also easy to work uh, in many contexts. The dirty soil, for example, as you know, when it's raining, it's very hard to work on an early, though very uh, productive soil. Then there is different options of crop, not only the staple crop, maize, wheat, or uh, rice, but uh, more and more, especially nearby the household, it's uh, encouraged to grow, and farmers do traditionally grow vegetables and other crop that they can quickly harvest during the season to, for their consumption when water uh, is available. Uh, at the, you know. Couple of questions I would like to ask you on like, of course, maintaining the soil in a very productive way. It's something farmers uh, are concerned. Simple practice like conservation agriculture practice based on the three principles, as you know, on minimum soil uh, disturbance, not tilling the soil is uh, uh, one of the conservation properties. Uh, permanent soil coverage uh, with the residue and crop diversification are the three basic principles of conservation agriculture. Uh, put that in, uh, in principle, it's quite simple. In practice, as you know, especially in the sub-Saharan African region, it's quite challenging here picture on the left, like that's the ideal practice. Once you harvest, you put uh, as much in, depends on the soil and the crop that you have, but 30% generally recommended at least to maintain, on, to have a good soil coverage. But in Ethiopia, the most value of those uh, crop residue in general, it's uh, for feed of the livestock. So here you see a pile of, uh, the, all the residues that was collected the, in the field. And then it's like uh, big houses, but that's for all season long uh, for the uh, livestock, uh, the, the cattle mostly. Uh, the other practice that is uh, challenging in some of these contexts is the minimum tillage uh, or residue retention uh, combined because 
land preparation is a key component on planting on time and having the right window for when the rain comes. Uh, in sandy soil, it's relatively easy. In more the verti soil or uh, the black soil heavy, it can be quite hard here. Like uh, in, in some places, like even I mean, child or woman uh, generally are used for the hard labor. In in Ethiopia, it's mostly men, but time to time you see even women farmers that do uh, use the the animal traction to to prepare the land because. Like for crops like uh, teff uh, that are widely uh, the most important cereal in Ethiopia, you need to till three times to have a sufficient uh, fine soil to to broadcast the the teff, which is very thin. The ideal practice is uh, like uh, minimum tillage or making big uh, holes and planting, but that's also quite time consuming. Here, it's uh, in the research. Uh, context. Crop diversification in various soil type is also something that is uh, widely promoted, but in practice, depending on the tools, especially whether it's mechanized or not, it can be quite challenging to re to leave the residue decomposed during the off season and uh, be able to uh, put plant early in the season while the rain is sufficient. Not having the proper uh, is also to do, uh, uh, so more and more there are many projects working on small tools. So different set other crops are used: uh, the beans, uh, common beans, faba bean here on the right. Uh, some of more perennial type. Uh, kind of uh, legume can be used like chickpea, which can be kept for a couple of seasons so that uh, you don't need to also, to, you have different intercropping uh, methods. In the various landscapes, the uh, diversification can be also local knowledge that can be tapped into. So uh, in Ethiopia, there is like uh, an interesting crop that is called, I don't know if you have heard or know about it, the false banana and set. It's a, it's a relative of banana, but you don't uh, use uh, the, you don't eat, it doesn't produce the fruit, but it's mostly the tub, tuber that is used for uh, different kind of food. And especially in the off season or in the, after the cereal harvested, that's in many cases the crop that the farmers uh, nearby the household or in different contexts uh, use the tuber for the, the, and it's a very important food security crop in, in some uh, of the region in Ethiopia. So uh, various ways that farmers do adapt to some of these practices, then from I'll highlight some of the uh, result that uh, I, I collected in in those contexts. You know the theory, like uh, depending on the soil on the left, uh, the response of the crop uh, here in terms of yield, but it can be like a biomass or also number of uh, seed uh, panicle, etc. You have this kind of the usual curve uh, that is ideally going from you, you have an optimum critical level within the range of uh, the concentration of nutrient in the soil. And then above optimum, it can be flat or it can be decreased uh, depending on uh, the type of nutrient. But in reality, it's more the right side, depending on the main complement, like uh, when you produce same type of crop or the response, depending on the soil, it's quite variable. and. There are many of these uh, supposedly non-fertile, uh, non-responsive uh, soil where no matter it can be high, it can be low. So it can be like you don't need the non-fertile, uh, fertile non-responsive soil I, are those who are very, the black soil type or the soil that productive even you don't need much, but you still need to maintain that. That's the challenge. The uh, kind of case most uh, in the agriculture system in hopefully the responsive soil. But in Africa, uh, in overall in the world, it's estimated 30% of the soil are degraded and 
respond less and less to the nutrient uh, input, while some of the soils are actually uh, not responsive at all. So that's a big challenge for the researchers, the farmers, to uh, make this soil uh, rehabilit uh, restored. So a couple of uh, concrete examples of the type of variability that can be encountered in that context. So soil fertility is what important, but depending on the context here, a couple of season trials in left side, it's more the sandy loam type of soil. On the right side, the black type soil. But you see, depending on the season and on the soil type, the response are not quite as uh, in the theory uh, of uh, at actually the x axis here, it's plant density. So the usual factor that farmers try to use when the, they don't have actually uh, fertilizer extra input, it's the easiest factor, number of seeds per heel, the density to work on. But even in that context, the yield response is not as a lead, like a optimal curve, or uh, in many cases, it's in a very few case on the 2015 bottom right season, you see the expected response. But in many cases, uh, it was a quite a challenge to find the way to advise farmers to get the best uh, yield, the best crop response from that. So. Those are some of the questions I put to your attention and results. Uh, the complexity of the soil response are, as you know, uh, something that extension research and farmers need to work out. Here are very interesting results on the way, like NDVDI, some of, many of you might know, it's the normalized difference uh, vegetation index, which is related to crop greenness basically so that's a factor in general so the more first the nitrogen uh, based fertilizer you use normally that's the uh, general uh, issue but in non-responsive or degraded soil that is not uh, very conducive in many cases so the other a usual other effect that with nutrient omission trial you try to see is to see which is the most limiting factor and you can see in the trend that the uh, supplementation of phosphorus then uh, phosphorus added with uh, potassium give a uh, higher expected yield and ultimately uh, the micronutrient uh, also add to the potential yield, but also as uh, highlighted at the start to uh, fix the nutrient uh, deficiency from the soil, but different ways to do that, not only uh, focusing on the soil, biofortification, food implementation is also alternative that you can use. So I would try to wrap up the presentation so that uh, we also there is on the one side, yes, soil, diverse soil type. I just highlighted a couple of uh, examples here, not to go too much into detail, but the crop diversity is another component that you work on to either compensate the, the deficiency of the soil type because some of the crops are less demanding. Some of these ways to uh, alternate or intercrop or rotate are uh, other uh, ways to try to fix I mean, get the best response from the soil where you are at. I will end the, my talk uh, this on asking and reflecting with you some of these uh, reflection uh, for you. And there might be also some pool question, but we can engage the discussion. What's the relation between soil and plants? Is that more soil? to produce nutritious plants, or are you using more, uh, seeing the crops as a way to restore uh, the health of soil? How do you maintain nutrient balance uh, while you keep productivity of your crops? Uh, and you might also give some uh, ways to 
to the context where you are, some of the response that I showed might be relevant or not for you. What are the break practices for the soil fertility and plant nutrition in your case? And I would be quite keen to know what available information are you using to make decision on fertility uh, in respect to uh, getting the best response of the soil or in terms of getting the more productivity from the soil. So those are some of the thoughts I wanted to share and the results. And thank you for your attention. Many thanks, Hiko. And maybe would you like to bring up your slide with the questions again? So just that people can have a yes, look yes. and if they feel like you can also just type um, type your answers in the chat. So we have um, okay, we have an. Um, 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 an answer from Brazil, and he's saying that Brazil has had the same latitude as a tuber, has an excellent government research center such as Embrapa with more sustainable technology and less intensive use of chemical fertilizers that need to be purchased for large companies, leaving the farmer hostage to the purchases. Why not use more sustainable techniques such as agroforestry, syntropy, green manuring, regenerative agriculture, instead of thinking only about fertilizing fields with agrochemical packages? So there was one comment from Leandro. Thank you. Hiko, you want to say something to the what he just commented sure. in the chat? No, uh, yeah, I, I also visited the uh, Embrapa in Goiania, uh, where they have the rice and bean research institute, I believe. Uh, I had a colleague who worked there. So now good to hear example from Brazil. Yes, in your in Brazil, you have a very strong research uh, center and extension system, and that's probably yes the the. What you say it's true, like uh, some of these more uh, sustainable uh, methods uh, are the one at APO that we also promote and try to encourage uh, farmers. But the reality is that in many of the uh, contexts, uh, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, farmers do not have either the knowledge, either the alternative input. So it's difficult to have that uh, level uh, as a starting point, but that's, that doesn't mean that it's not possible, but it needs a lot of uh, context-based uh, I mean, research uh, uh, support, extension systems, so that farmers uh, can, uh, within the option that they have, improve the practices uh, based on the one that they're doing. So, uh, ideally, that's always like at FAO or UN organization, we promote this uh, more like agroecological based or agroforestry based, but it cannot be always uh, I mean, the need of context based support is, I believe, the most important for farmers to so that we as a researcher or uh, extension agent understand the real problematic have the data and do collect the data and result to make it a more systematic way. And then based on that, try to have the entry points on what is the easiest kind of low hanging fruits to get the farmers to change their practice because that's the, I believe the first hurdle to have farmers being able to have that mindset to change something that they are used to do and improve some have some results because the long-term effect is not perceptible immediately, even conservation of parties. Combining those three components is a very hard uh, kind of barrier at the start. 
So starting with some of these practice and see what are the entry points is important. And uh, then, yes, uh, have the more longer term uh, practice combined. But that's something also I, I would also like to hear from from your side uh, on. Uh, yes, what what uh, do you experience or uh, are you able to, to practice to make that change? What are the drivers of your decision? as farmer would be something that uh, uh, I would also like to hear. Yeah. Thank you, Hiko. Um, we have also posted now the questions in the chat. So please feel free to type in the chat or also raise your hand and we give you the floor. There's also another um, comment from Carmel in the chat. And I just read it, or oh, Carmel, you just want to say it. I think it's better that you say it, that I read it out loud. <laughs> uh, yeah, sure. I just was gonna comment on the first question. Hello, everyone. Um, I was just uh, saying, I was thinking about the first question with you know, how plants relate with soil and which one feeds each other. And, and they essentially are, are, are feeding each other. All, all the time and helping each other uh, have more capacity to grow and increase because the plants are constantly feeding the soil life with um, liquid carbon, essentially like sugars that is produced by the photosynthesis process. And so that's making all of the microbial life happy and, and abundant. And that microbial life is also then processing nutrients and feeding it to the plants. So, and as those, and as well as those, those microbe, the microbial life is also decomposing the plant matter and turning that into carbon, um, carbon matter in the soil, which holds more water. And that, you know, more water for the, the microbial life and more water for the plant. And that allows for more plant life to grow, allow for more liquid carbon to be pumped into the ground. And so they, they work in unison essentially. And uh, that's, you can see things working in unison together, co-benefiting, working together to both live everywhere in the way animals live together, the way animals deal with plants. And, and so it's just a common thing, yeah. Many thanks. So meanwhile, Pico, we also have prepared a poll so I would say we bring up the poll and people still please think about the questions what we posted in the chat. And if you want to say something to the talk of Hiko or your um, experiences with soil, please raise your hand and speak up. So we have a poll and we, we are asking which of the following measures do you take to keep your soil fertile? And you have um, different measures you can choose on. Cover crops, compost, animal manure, maintenance of green soil cover, external organic fertilizers, agroforestry, and minimum tillage and or no measure. So meanwhile, people are voting in, uh, for the poll. We have another comment in the chat saying, soil is the cradle of life, not only for plants. The soil is well ventilated by good plowing and the addition of composted animal manure and plant remains residues. Yeah. 
Hiko, can you see the poll? Yes. Okay. Any other raised hand, it's in. Sure. Ah, I have a raised hand. Thank you, Hiko. <laughs> yes, please. Thank you. I'm Jura. I work in the southeast part of uh, Europe, in Serbia, actually, at a privately owned research center. So uh, you show some pictures, some uh, of your experience uh, from Africa, and fields were extremely weed free. So I suppose due to usage of herbicide. And uh, my question is is it possible to make a simple answer? Uh, what is more sustainable to have uh, conservational soil tillage plus herbicides and pesticides in general, or to go with organic agriculture and uh, to use some reduced or minimum soil tillage? What is more harmful to, to, to soil microbe system? Yes, uh, thank you for your question. Uh, the pictures I showed you in many contexts, yes, uh, I mean, that's true. Uh, farmers, especially when uh, conservation ag in agriculture is introduced in those contexts, it comes as a package with uh, herbicide use, uh, the commonly known one, because to reduce tillage uh, at the start, uh, it's something uh, if done manually uh, becomes quite hard because they don't have the proper equipment. Uh, otherwise, so that's in general a practice that was uh, a package, but not necessarily when it's a small plot or so it's done by hand weeding, but then Compared to plowing the soil, it gives also uh, more burden for the women and children if you promote this as a like uh, on, like without uh, any alternative to reduce the weed pressure at the start. So that's something that needs probably uh, depending on the on the area, the type of soil and equipment that farmers do have. Uh, but that's that's something uh, that environmentally not necessarily uh, friendly because you then rely on external chemicals. But the, the bigger challenge is that even though farmers do want to use the herbicide, it's not available in many places. So relying to those external input is not a practice that's uh, encouraged. But depending on context, there is always a trade-off on having a starting point for the technological kind of uh, improvement while you don't want to introduce another dependency. So uh, the question is very relevant. I would not be able to straightly answer. The one reflection I was uh, actually uh, I had is the one single technology to increase the yield and productivity in many of those contexts is weed control. If we have proper ways, either for from like the more friendly way, like green coverage or residue that then we reduce the pressure. But when you have a heavily tilled soil, it's hard to get uh, rid of the many different seeds uh, in the soil uh, from the start. So it takes a couple of years before you can stabilize and have less uh, wild uh, weeds to compete with the either uh, having a cover crop, either residue uh, coverage so that you reduce the weed pressure. But weed management is definitely a key uh, component to, to get uh, some of the more sustainable practice uh, and the change uh, for farmers. I would say that's one key aspect that we need to work more on and have more research on that in the different contexts. Yeah, I also just want to point out that according to Naturland standards, there is no herbicide use and chemical use permitted. And we work on this 
options what I, we just have asked for in the poll now, a lot of cover crop and also green manuring, and of course, co of course, of composting, and um, also agroforestry, for example, in our standard for coffee and cocoa. And then I go also to the comment we have here in the chat. We are asking for an agroforest system. And here, um, a comment from Mozambique. She, um, she's saying that she has a very small scale farm, like around one hectare, where she does agroforestry since three years. And my best practice is when I start a bed newly, I take the weeds out, minimally disturbing the soil. Then I mix 50% biochar plus 50% bukashi or Arab aerobic compost soil, and then cover all with first bigger sticks. Then the smaller branches, the grass is a final cover. I have a planted moringa, loitzena, gluricidina, banana, papaya, guava, and so on. No tillage, no animal products all biosectly vegan. I'm sharing my knowledge with locals. In Mozambique, 80% of the population is still working in agriculture, many subsistence farmers. 90% have less than five hectares. About 85% have only one to two hectares. So it's not feasible to use manure. It would be an external input. So I'm working with secular with what my little piece of land gives. I'm happy as most indigenous trees here are leguminous trees. Greetings from Maputo. Uh, great, thank you for this comment. Very long comment, but I thought it was worthwhile to read it out loud. Um, so Hiko, I think we are coming more or less to the end of this of your session, let's say. Yes. Thank you, and Sabine, for sharing your, your detailed uh, experience. That's uh, very uh, insightful. Yeah. And also please have a look what um, Leandro just shared with us in the chat. He shared with us two videos. So um, please um, have a look at it later on. And also regarding the poles, what you can see here, Hiko, is that compost and cover crop, but also like animal manure and also um, are like the, the main components. And then, of course, we also have maintenance of green soil covers. And only 36% are using actually external organic fertilizers. 23% of the 50, 56 people who voted are doing agroforestry. And we also have people, people who are um, conducting minimum tillage. So you want, Hiko, you want to have a last word? Or, yeah, you're fine. We can follow up uh, at the end if uh, there is enough time. But uh, no, thank you for your comments and uh... Uh, I take note of uh, the chat and uh, I hope we, we have some time at the end to wrap up. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much, Hiko. Okay. So I will now hand over to Kamel Abu Farah, who is from Canaan Fair Trade, which is, uh, they are Naturland members which gather around 84 farmers in Palestine and delight the world with their high quality olive oils. And he will talk about biodiversity and soil. So Carmel, the floor is yours. And also the before I give you the floor, Carmel, sorry. I just wanted to mention the presentation of Hiko was in English, but we will um, made it available later on, make it available later on in Spanish. And the presentation in Carmel is in English as well, but we will post a link in the chat where you can have the Spanish translation. So Carmel, I give you the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. Uh, it's an honor to be here, everyone. Um, I'm just going to share my screen quick. And... Um, First of all, I just want to thank all the farmers here that are in the, the event. You guys are the ones that are taking care of our land and feeding us and keeping us away from the doctors. Um, so, and um, 
by the poll that was made, the second one, it seems like a lot of you are composting, which is awesome. There's a lot of awesome uh, stuff y'all are doing. So I'm very happy to see that. Uh, so I'm here to talk about biodiversity and the soil and how that goes together. And uh, to start off, I'm going to uh, ask you guys a question essentially. And uh, that is, uh, how many crops are on your farm? And uh, Ava, would you put up the, the poll for that? Because uh, I'm, I'm curious, just as uh, we were curious to see what you guys are doing on the farm, curious to see how your guys' farm look like. And um, here's a, a farm in Palestine we have, and we have some olive trees and some cherry trees and some almond trees and uh, some fava beans growing in between them, as well as some wild uh, herbs and a carob tree in the background. And um, everything about what I want to talk about today is, is what's the function of that? How does that um, address some of our farming challenges, uh, sustainability, viability, sovereignty? Um, so I'm just uh, seeing the results come in here. Um, but essentially, uh, having diversity in the in our farms is essentially using the functions of nature um, to produce food, because that's what we farm. Or we produce food for ourselves, and so we have to have this balance between how much food we're trying to produce and the utilization of nature's functions. So when, if you think about a forest, a forest has a huge diversity, a huge complexion, and there's, everything's working together. There's a whole cycle in the, in the food chain and they're all supporting each other and they balance each other out and they stabilize and they're at, they're when you take all of that and just make it flat and only plant like one thing as like a monoculture you exponentially are increasing the production of whatever you're trying to grow but you're also exponentially decreasing the function of nature and how it repairs itself and how it feeds itself to create life and to foster life. And so there's, there's this inevitable balance that we have to create between our production of our crops and how much we wanna produce uh, in conjunction with utilizing those natural functions and having a diversity of maybe a plant that isn't giving you a crop, but is providing a function to the soil or the water or the mineral cycle, or maybe a certain animal that provides another function that helps your ecosystem farm, essentially. Your farm is essentially an ecosystem function. And, uh, as an example, I mean, if you think about a big field of, of, of tomatoes, um, if you just have just tomatoes, for anything that likes tomatoes, you're gonna, you essentially created a full buffet for them to just be like, oh, you made all these tomatoes just for me? And, and that's where the farm challenge comes where we have to create solutions. And a lot of our modern solutions are you know, spraying with chemicals to deal with some certain insect that is coming to eat your tomatoes. And by nature, there's a complexion where that, the, that, that insect or whatever that 
thing that's eating those tomatoes are, they have so many more barriers when there's complexity, when it's not just an open field just of tomatoes for them to go find easily, where there's so many things in their way, so many potential predators in their way or other plants in their way to um, make it harder for them. And that's how nature inevitably works is not everything is um, so perfectly isolated, but everything has its space and everyone gets a little bit of the share. And so we have to balance. And um, uh, I liked a lot of, of um, Heiko, by the way, thank you for your presentation. It was very insightful. And um, he had mentioned several times how creating that balance, actually practicing inputting those functions of nature into, into practice, how challenging that can be. Um, so uh, let's, let's see the, the polls here. So uh, some of you, 21% are one. Okay, then we have two to five is 40, 17, and then 23. So this is a diverse group, and that's, that's really cool. Um, uh, that's, so so let's, let's talk more about what those functions are. Um, so one moment here. So um, essentially uh, the, the, the essence of, of nature is, is having an abundance of diversity. And, and how are we applying those principles of nature to the farm? And so the idea, before I get into the roots here, is um, more life creates more life. And essentially what, that, what I mean by that is nature itself is developing and trans, transgressing to become more complex, to become, to foster more life. And the only thing that gets in its way is oftentimes uh, the changes in, in the weather um, that you know maybe some place where it's used to being rainy isn't rainy so more as much and and that's that's the main factor but in in a stable condition life is essentially building itself up and if you think about just the cycle of of the plant life and, and let, let's take like a tree for example and it it has leaves and it drops the leaves down and then those leaves get decomposed and those leaves essentially are are becoming slowly the 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 forest bed and growing growing the the soil the the, the amount of soil over time and that that process as, as those trees are, are year after year after year, this happens over thousands of years, you know, it's pulling up all kinds of nutrients and shading for other plants. And those other plants are, are creating uh, food or habitat for other species. And that's, that's an ecosystem becoming more complex essentially. Um, because all of everything is, is, is connected. And the more there is of, of one thing, the more allows something else to feed off of it. So um, just for some context, this is what Palestine looks like. This is where I live. And uh, this is the kinds of farms that um, I'm working with. I, I represent, uh, as Ava said, um, a network of farmers, 84 of which are, are Naturland certified, but we are a organic and fair trade um, uh, organization that, that work with over a thousand farmers actually uh, exporting uh, to Europe and the US and Asia. So, so essentially, this is the context where we have, and these are olive trees and, and a bunch of other 
wild herbs and and uh, bees, and uh, as well as other insects. But this is this is essentially um, uh, a good example of of lots of different trees and lots of different things in between the trees. And we're going to talk about what that means. So we have, we're going to talk about roots. We're going to talk about water. We're going to talk about what farmers can do in relation to biodiversity and their function in this ecosystem. Um, uh, I'm not going to tell you guys how to do your job. I'm just going to tell you how to um, the, the, the principles of how we as human beings um, can engage in these ecosystems. And then um, how, how engaging with these principles can ultimately create stability. So if we look at roots, um, this is an example of root systems in, in, in a prairie. And what we find in diversity is uh, in plants is a diversity of roots. And why is that important? So when you have every root, it has its own shape, has its own depth, has its own pattern. And so when different plants with different root systems are next to each other, they're filling each other's gaps. You have, you have uh, trees that have tap roots that go deep, deep down in the ground. You have other trees that spread out. And so when you combine different plants with different root structures, you're utilizing a greater surface area of not only collection of nutrients, but you're also um, holding the soil in more places. You're, you're bringing up you're, you're accessing more nutrition in more places. And you're also, uh, you're also feeding all of the microbial life in the soil in more places. So you have a more active soil. So, I mean, if you just look at this picture and imagine one of these plants was the only plant well, then you're gonna instantly be missing out on all that other space. And this is an example of a prairie, but if you take an example of a forest with huge trees, with short trees, with bushes, with shrubs, with little herbs, with grasses, you can just imagine for a moment how there's so many levels and spaces of the soil that are being activated, that are working, that are, that are being held. And that, that is a key core function of, of an ecosystem that we can apply to our farms. And, and as, as a simple example, that that tree with a tap root that goes really deep, deep down, when you take that tree, when it drops its leaves, or when, it, when you like prune some of its branches and that goes back into the soil, you're taking nutrients deep down in the soil that all of those other little plants at the top or you know, that have shallow root systems, those plants would never get access to those nutrients. And so the trees act as, as big arms reaching down and dropping for the other, the other little guys. And that's, that's a function. That's a function that we can utilize to fertilize our, our smaller crops with larger trees. And that that's really where the innovation that has so much untapped potential really lies, is, is how we pair different plants, different trees with different shrubs and different root systems that can kind of complete each other in a way and can offer each other 
uh, different functions. So when we talk about uh, the root systems and, and, and the diversity of that, we can apply the same thing above ground in relation to water. So with water, think of water. Th this, is, this picture is, is a representation of, of water as all of these grasses, this was taken, this is grass, wild grasses that is growing between the olive trees here in Palestine. It was a nice, um, nice morning hike for that day. But um, all of these blades of grass are essentially harvesting water that morning. Okay. And if those, if, and, and this is a prime example of what you guys clearly well understand is the, the function of cover crop. It's, um, it's not only protecting the soil from drying out, but it can also be uh, a collection of water because all of those surface areas of blades of grass are collecting water and it's dripping down into the soil. Now take the diversity of the roots and the different levels, let's say not just these grasses, but there's also bushes, there's also trees, you're having a greater surface area of collecting water. And uh, for those of you that um, know about the rainforest, uh, something that, that, that we commonly learn about the rainforest uh, in, 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 around the equator is how the sheer amount of plant matter and, and water that's evaporating off of all of the, the plants are actually creating clouds to rain again. And it's self-cycling in itself. And that's essentially what we can do at a less extreme scale in other parts of the world is the more, the more levels, the more surface area you have above ground, the more capacity of collecting water you have to self-fulfill the, the ecosystem. And so this also doesn't just apply to collecting water, but it also applies to slowing water down. Um, because when it rains, you wanna utilize as much of that water as possible. And the way you can do that is uh, by, yes, of course, growing soil, but part of that is slowing the water. And so all of these plants are little barriers of letting the water flow across the land. And, and that, that allows for more water to penetrate down into the aquifers beneath the ecosystem you're, you're taking care of versus it flowing away into some other part of, um, some other part far away from, from your farm. And so it becomes, as I said, a, way, a medium for the plants and the diversity of them. It's a diversity of slowing the water down. It's diversity of, of collecting the water. And it's also a diversity of holding the water because every plant body is a water tank. And just so when you see a, a, a piece of land every plant you're seeing is, is a potential for, if, if it's getting dry, in particular, we in Palestine have a dry season, every plant is, is holding on to its water to the last minute. And that is holding on water and activating water into the soil every last minute. And you know, for us in Palestine, that's huge because at some point it gets so hot and dry, it's literally everything dies except for the trees and some certain shrubs. And so the more plant life we have, the longer we can have greenery and activated soil throughout into the dry season. Um, this also applies to how you balance perennial plants versus annual plants. These are often farmed exclusively 
But when you incorporate perennial plants in your annual plants, you're essentially, imagine just a field where you're growing only corn, for example. Any time where the, when you harvest the corn or when you, you are preparing for the corn to grow, every time in between that where the, crow, the corn is, is not growing, um, your soil is essentially dormant. And so incorporating different elements and layers of perennial plants that can keep the soil activated um, can, can effect, effectively maintain the, the, the microbial life and the fertility inside the soil in between your, your annual systems. So um, what can farmers do? This is the beauty of, of what we as, as people can do in, in, with these ecosystems is we can observe how these processes are happening, these cycles of nutrients, these cycles of water, and we can pinpoint where to speed up that process. And so if there's, uh, I started the, this, the, the topic on, on finding different plants that you can, that can pair together well, well, you can observe these things in nature or you can observe these things by your own creation in, in testing out planting things next to each other based on their root systems or based on their function. And you can grow that, you can plant. We can, we're, we're masters of planting. Where, whereas, whereas, you know, plants depend on themselves in a lot of ways to just at, at chance or, or have other animals, uh, you know, create a dynamic where their seed gets planted and is successful. We have the capacity to nurture plants and animals very, very well. We're really good at doing that. And so we have the capacity to increase and be intentional about the diversity that exists in any particular land. And we can increase uh, the, the potential for that biodiversity to live with the tools. And I mean, if, if if like maybe by itself, this tree wouldn't have um, grown on its own in this dry climate, but if you water it for the first couple of years and it established a deep enough root system, then it can live on its own. And there you jump started a whole, like, essentially decades and centuries worth of ecological progression you jumpstarted that just through our own in intuition. And so we have a very powerful uh, ability, essentially. So um, the, for one of the things I wanna just talk about is pruning and processing. And what is that doing? This is an example of speeding up that cycle because essentially all of these plants are growing. And um, as I mentioned earlier, when the biomass of these plants goes to the ground, there's all these little critters and, and microbial life that are decomposing this and essentially adding to the carbon matter in the soil. So that happens very slowly. And we can essentially make that happen faster by not only pruning the plants, which in effect gets the biomass from the living plant to the ground much faster. But that pruning process in itself has been discovered that it, it, um, it sparks the, the, the plant itself to grow more, to, to uh, grow new branches. It, uh, sometimes, in some cases, in some plants, in some trees, it will actually spark it to fruit. And that 
that process is essentially pushing the plant to make the photosynthesis process happen faster. And that photosynthesis process happening faster is increasing the potential of the carbon absorbed from the atmosphere to go into, be made into soil. And so that's something that we can just engage with all the time. And then processing it, this is just a, a very short video of us taking these, um, taking these olive prudings and breaking them down into these little bits. And what does that do? Uh, if anyone, for you composters out there, you know that a nice compost, uh, you need, it'll compost a lot better when you have fine bits. If you try to throw uh, a big log in your compost pile, well, maybe the outside of your log is going to convert into compost, but <laughs> it's going to take a lot of time. And so we have this capacity to take this carbon rich material, wood, and break it into pieces. So there's all these little surface areas where all the microbial life can attach to it and break it down. And so we have this, this potential to ignite and speed up these natural processes that take, unfortunately, a really long time. And it takes a long time even for us engaging with it. But it's us engaging with it that gives us that highest potential of, of utilizing the land to produce food for us. And so uh, the, the second process uh, here is, is grazing um, as, as a medium of having the animals basically do what we're doing, but in different contexts in different ways, because the, the, the grazing animals um, can essentially, they're pruning the grasses and the shrubs and also the, the forageable trees. And they're doing that and igniting that growth stage. The, the grass essentially is growing really, really fast. And as it gets into its adulthood of grass, it starts growing slower. And if you cut it, it's gonna boost up and, and try and grow again because a part of its nature is it wants to get to that seeding point. And that seeding point, if you take it away, well, it's gonna keep trying to grow really hard, essentially. And the great thing about grazing is it's doing so many things at the same time. It's not just doing that pruning process, but the, the bacteria in the stomachs of the animals as they're dropping their manure throughout where they're walking, that's adding microbial um, diversity to the soil. It's adding nitrogen to the soil. They're also spreading seeds and increasing the biodiversity regionally throughout the, the area where they walk. And at the same time, their hooves are breaking up any little soil caps that happen over time. They're, they're almost doing essentially uh, a minimal amount of, of tillage that allows for the water to penetrate into the soil a little bit better while not while while maintaining it being covered it's like it's like a win 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 and like they do it all for you they're happy <laughs> they just need you to walk them along but they'd walk themselves if you let them and and so you know that's that's our partnership with with animals is is letting them uh, doing some of the pruning and processing for us and with us. And essentially, um, you know, th this whole process here is, is to create, create stability, create stability for, for everyone right now and the future of, uh, of generations. And, and, and why is that creating stability? Because you are creating um, the natural, you're allowing the natural processes to go ha to happen and produce more soil, for the soil to hold more carbon, 
um, or have more carbon in it to hold more water, to effectively cycle the nutrients throughout the land from the land itself. This is this is this is the the, the taproot trees feeding the other trees. Essentially, essentially bringing your nutrients and and the fertility of your land from your own land, not from somewhere else. And that creates sovereignty. And that process and that knowledge of how these plants are working together in your ecosystem that you're taking care of, that's a knowledge and a wisdom that you farmers have and, and can pass on to, to your children because it's, it's not necessarily a direct science because science depends on on control and there's anything but control in nature <laughs> and there and so there is there is a degree of of intuition that is needed that that every indigenous uh, community and society has a, a level of understanding that is being that that is at risk of being lost um, by 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 using more prescriptive uh, methods of, of, of outsourcing uh, solutions for simplistic systems. And so this, di this diversity, it's, it's a diversity to use nature's functions for the benefit of the fertility of your farm. It's also uh, an opportunity to have more, um, more different kinds of crops, which are different, um, which are different kinds of income throughout the year for you. So it's not just having all your eggs in one basket of this crop is going to, to you know, pay my bills for the year, but rather you have depend, you have, you can depend on different avenues of income. And if one doesn't work out so well, well, you have a bunch of others throughout the year. And also you have different reasons to come to your land and work on it and engage with it. So while you're you know, taking care of your apple trees over here, you can also be um, maybe engaging with some bees that are pollinating flowers in between them. So you can do different things at the same time with one visit rather than visiting your farm for one reason and then going back somewhere, whether it's to your house down the road or whether it's a half hour drive from where you live. Um, and so, and, and the, the, the essence of, of this ecosystem and its complexity creates resiliency in diseases and in pests, it makes, it makes it hard for, for any, any one thing to spread quickly because it's a complex system. So you naturally, all of the crops that you are growing are going to, by nature, as nature is designed and intended to work, stabilize itself and not have any one thing overtake it completely. And so this is, this is a, a concept, it's a principle and it's a principle that we have from nature that can effectively um, create a stable, a stable uh, ecosystem for us to live from, for now and for the future. Thank you for listening. Many thanks, Kamel. Um, great talk. So. Um, we also have posted a question in the chat, like what experience do you have? Do you have similar or contrary observations at your farm? Or do you face special problems trying to use some practices? So please feel free to raise your hand if you want to ask Kamel something directly, or you would like to make a comments to the questions what we posted in the chat. Or also, if you want to ask something more about Hiko's talk. 
please feel free to, to speak up. Carmen, I have a question. So in total, you have like 1,000 farmers and most of them produce, um, I have olive trees and also something else, right? Yeah, we're, um, we mainly, most of the farmers are producing olives and have various things growing in between their olive trees that they most of them are are finding local markets for most of our purchases from the farmers um include olives and um we, we work with almond uh the almond crop a lot as well and um and wheat uh, is, is another crop that that we work with um that we purchase as well as um we have a a wild caper foraging program where where we have teams of people that forage wild capers and, and spread the seeds of wild capers as they do that. Um, and yeah, essentially the 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 setting of of uh, the farm here often has olive trees and there's lots of wild herbs and wildflowers and grasses uh, growing in between them. Um, commonly, you'll have uh, prickly pear cacti uh, growing along the perimeters of a lot of people's land. Um, that's kind of like a, 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 a kind of distinction how farmers make um, divide up the land um, between themselves. And it also has its own function as being a living plant that is filled with water as well. And you'll have fig trees and cherry trees and different kinds of stone fruit trees um, that are kind of scattered in between the olive trees oftentimes. And uh, oftentimes shepherds are independently grazing in between the olive orchards in their own uh, systematic way. And you have um, some farmers are intercropping. In, instead of leaving it wild, uh, some farmers are planting uh, leguminous um, food things like uh, chickpeas and lentils and fava beans. Uh, occasionally, wheat as well is growing in between the olive trees. So these are some, uh, yeah, some context of, of how the land works. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So we have one question in the chat that Afram, he wants to ask you, Kamel, how many olive tree cultivates every farmer and how much is the yield per year? Um, okay, so the olive tree we have on average um, these numbers i don't have them in my head <laughs> so that might be a little bit difficult for me to, to answer but i can tell you that that um let's say uh like an olive tree, a fully mature one can produce anywhere from around a uh, hundred kilograms uh, or, or 50 to, to 200 kilograms of olives uh, on, a, on a mature tree. And uh, we had a really amazing harvest this year where farmers were giving like, yeah, like 200, 250, 300, 300 olive, kilograms of olives on their tree. And uh, it was an exceptional harvest this year. That's, that's why. But I can, I can get those numbers to, um, 
of Brahm uh, later. If, yeah, I mean, yes, we we can provide those numbers later on. Because the idea is also to send a little report on this event um, later on, so we can also add those numbers later. So we have another question from Nina. Nina, you want to say it by yourself? <laughs> yeah, Kamel, thank you very much. I just wondered, how do you decide or evaluate what you, you plan as just observing nature? Uh, do you do special research or do exchange with other producers? So, because, uh, um, yeah, I'm just interested how you do it. Or do you do like try and error? How do you do it? Well, there's a few ways you can go about it. It depends um, what function you're trying to achieve. So some of the functions that we have are, are inherited knowledge. Like for example, we commonly have carob trees um, in different plots throughout the olive trees and the carob tree attracts this wasp that eats this fly that eats the olives. So it's a kind of integrated pest management that, that also produces a crop. So there's multi-functions. And at the same time, this tree happens to uh, be nitrogen fixing. And so it's just like with, uh, you know, it, it, it can be whether you're trying to um, deal with a, a, a pest issue and, and find a solution for it, or it can be um, a matter of a function if you're trying to um, direct the wind in a certain way, you're going to pick trees that are good windbreakers. If you're trying to increase, um, like I said, for the, the idea of a tap root, for example, like olives, they have very widespread root systems. And so um, planting something like a fig next to an olive tree, it's a fig has a, a big tap root. So you're by design, you, you essentially know the kinds of root systems and you can pair these root systems where they don't interfere with each other as, as a kind of um, function. So it really depends um, if you have particular issues or if you like, for example, there are certain trees that just grow really, really fast and those can be good at um, essentially just producing carbon where you prune them yearly very vigorously and just chop them up into wood chips and put them around the land. And that that is like a super boost to create biomass. So it's all it's all relevant to uh, like the, uh, I'll give you another example, like uh, around vegetables, you can um, plant uh, like really, really smelly plants, maybe like thyme or sage. Um, and, and those kinds of smells can deter a lot of insects. So you can make rows of like rosemary, for example, next to your tomatoes uh, or next to your vegetable bed. And that acts as like a barrier of, of, of essence that, that a lot of insects won't like to get to. So it's, it's, yeah, it's all related to the function and, and what you're trying to achieve. Okay. We have another question in the chat uh, from Leandro from Brazil. Carmen, aren't the spontaneous plants that emerge considered the best adapted to promote the regeneration of these soils between crop lines where only commercial plants can be used? Oh, that's like a beautiful question as well, um, because the land literally speaks. I mean, it, it, the, the wild plants that are growing there are oftentimes providing, there's, there's, there's kind of this communication happening where the, the plants are, 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 that are growing naturally are growing there because that environment suits them. And while they exist in that land, 
they're also changing it like like the, the the nitrogen fixers that spontaneously pop up they're over time creating a more ni nitrogen rich soil which is going to over time make other plants other than them once that once that soil over time is super in nitrogen enriched less nitrogen enrichers are going to be existing and other plants are going to fill that gap and that's the natural progression of the regeneration process. And this is where, this is that ultimate difficult question is how you balance between using nature's functions and, and allowing spaces in your farm to just grow wild versus producing a crop that you want to sell and, you know, economically uh, feed your life and the function of your farm in the modern day. And that's the balance that everyone has to dictate. And in different contexts, um, in different, the different things that you're growing, in different climates, in different economic situations, that's, that's a, a decision and a balance every farmer has to, to kind of figure out where their sweet spot is. And there's a last question before I will wrap up. Please repeat the name of the tree used for integrated pest management for the olive fly. I'm also interested in this one. <laughs> the carob tree. The carob tree. It's, the carob uh, tree. It, creates, it creates this bean pod that's super sweet. You can make um, carob syrup out of it. It's actually it's one of our products. You can try it. But it's super, it's, um, yeah, it's a huge, beautiful tree. And um, it has an immense amount of functions. Uh, and you, yeah, you find it throughout, throughout Palestine. Right there. Uh, <laughs> can you type it in the chat, Camel? So many thanks again, Camel. And I will wrap up. Before I wrap up, um, oh, there is a. <laughs> There's another comment. Okay. I will read this last comment and then we wrap up. Vegan fruit grower here from Italy. 12 hectares of fruit, apple, pears, conversion into organic, aiming to veganic. Monoculture broken by two small woodlands, about 800, 800 lavender plants in a small apiary, not used for Reddit anymore just as the bees refuge. Very concerned about this planet. Soil is a living thing and animal agriculture is using two thirds of cultivable lands to grow intensively vegetables to feed plus 80 billions of caged animals slaughtered every year. This is a nightmare to any living thing, not only humans. Basically, soils are first seen as a rich property to use industrial technology and fossil fuels just driving the destruction. I see many clouds. Globalization is just a proof of selling other living lives or can be sustainable. Okay. Okay, I take this last comments to, to wrap up because that's also kind of what Hiko, I would say, presentation was a little bit about. It was about that um, how, how we can deal with nutrient depletion, what we are facing in the world. We have 33% of heavily or middle degraded soils. And this is a challenge and we really have to work on this. And also what I took home that it's very important that plants grow in a healthy environment soil, also that they can transmit the important nutrients to the humans. So they have, it's like we close the cycle with soil where the food begins, but it's also important that the nutrients from the plants are also transferred to, to the human, human beings. And also crop diversity, I would say is crucial, but as also Carmel and Tico, what they showed, it depends on your situation, on your climate and on where you are located, what is feasible, but the, the diversity of crops, the diversity of roots, 
for example, that the large tree can fertilize the, the smaller plants and also the function of cover crops um, is very crucial. And yeah, last but not least, we have a feedback survey on the seminar, which will be posted now in the chat. So please take some time to, to give us feedback on the seminar. And, and I thank you all for participating, especially many thanks to Hiku and Carmel that they took their time, their precious time, because they're very busy um, presenting here today. And also for everybody who posted questions, comments, videos in the chat, please feel free to post something else as well. And then we also have a last comment in the chat. So we have a dear Nicola, do you know about Biocyclic Wagon Network? It's a certification iPhone approved also. So you can also have a look into this one. There were also two videos posted in the chat. Please feel free. And also we will send um, the presentations and the material afterwards. And thank you so much for participating. And I wish you a good day. I mean, somebody, some people just starts now into the day. For some people, it's already quite late. And for some, it's nearly go, um, for going home. Okay, thank you so much.